Good afternoon, Jayhawks, and welcome back to this week's episode of Rock Shock Replay. I'm your host, Andrew Lind. Well, after two weeks being off the air, there has been a lot of important news surrounding KU Athletics and the sports world in general. On today's show, Maddie Beischel and Izzy English will talk everything about the NHL as the sport has returned to ESPN after being distant for 17 years. Now also, Jordan Ziegler and Kyle Mathis will keep us updated with the MLB playoff picture as the playing field has narrowed. Kristen Howe fills us in on everything KU Athletics Women's Edition, and Emma Lynette and I will dive into the beginning of the NBA season. All this and more on Rock Shock Replay. This afternoon, our show starts right here. I'm going to tell you a story about a Topeka man turned KU Jayhawk at birth, a man who now holds one of the most recognizable titles at KU, the voice of the Jayhawks. Brian Haney has been in this role since 2016, and his journey all started with an opportunity. Take a look. Lawrence, Kansas, the city where legendary sportscasters, young and old, left their mark. It's the birthplace of college basketball and Max Falkenstein and the home of the Jayhawks. But the Sunflower State is now the current home to a man who grew up right down the road in the capital city. And his name is Brian Haney, the voice of the Kansas Jayhawks. Man to man for West Virginia, Ochai Alam. Sports Center as Udoka rocks the rim with a posterizing flush. Haney, a Topeka West High School graduate, called KU home shortly after, and there was never a doubt about it. It's not that I was told I had to be a Jayhawk, I just wanted to be a Jayhawk. How could you say no to the William Allen White School of Journalism as names of greats, past and present, rang? through the halls. Uh, there were other options than Regents, certainly, but there's no way I was going to go to Mizzou. I was a born and bred Kansas Jayhawk, and no matter who they produced on ESPN, I wanted to come to Kansas. Kevin Harlan had been in Kansas. Tom Hedrick was teaching at Kansas. The guy that literally authored the book, The Art of Sportscasting, was teaching sports play-by-play -play here. Why would I go anywhere else? It was that combination of history and passion that led Brian Haney on a wild journey to success. The grit, the grind, and the sacrifice all led to an opportunity. At one point, I had three internships in the same summer to beat the Lawrence in Kansas City. I was working in a different town every day, but it was all about chasing that next opportunity. An opportunity that started as the co-host of Rock Chalk Sports Talk, a gig that the Topeka native rode for a decade before heading down south to Lubbock, Texas, taking the job as the voice of the Red Raiders. But Haney knew that Kansas was the place he truly wanted to come back to. You're in the conference, so you're seeing everybody twice a year, and that's why I took the job, by the way, so I would have top of mind where it's okay. I may have left temporarily, but I wasn't out of sight, out of mind entirely. And Becca Booth, whose family owned KLWN and managed Rock Chalk Sports Talk, created a Facebook page. Bring Brian Haney back to KU. And by the grace of God, people came out of the woodwork, outpouring with support. And sure enough, nine months later, Brian Haney returned to Kansas. It's, it's such a blessing to be at my alma mater, at the school I love, the people I love, uh, living my dream each day, and hopefully with each passing year, trying to do something bigger and better than we've done the year before. Not just in an on-air sense, but in a, in a community enrichment sense. Reporting for KUJH News, I'm Andrew Lind. It was not mentioned there, but the biggest takeaway for me is just taking advantage, advantage when those opportunities present themselves and finding ways to get involved. Brian Haney always seems to have insightful stuff for the next generation of sports journalists. Well, after this short break, Izzy and Maddie will have updates on the new NHL season. Stay tuned. From adversity, we rose. We made history and became pioneers, voyagers, champions, Jayhawks. And when our chant rises, haunting and hallowed, 
Jayhawks are telling the world what's near. Victory. Welcome back. Now, it was an exciting week for the National Hockey League as they were welcomed back to ESPN, airing for the first time on television since 2004. And it was sure a great game to, for the first game to air as the now top-ranked Pittsburgh Penguins took down the reigning Stanley Cup champions, the Tampa Bay Lightning. For the first time since 2000, the Penguins played the game without Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin. The rookies for the team did not disappoint and helped the Penguins win 6-2 in Tampa Bay's home arena. Danton Heinen, who recently signed a $1.1 million contract with the team, scored the league's opening goal and his first career goal with the Penguins. Not long after that, another newbie put the Penguins two to, ahead 2-0. to Center Brian Boyle, who had a professional tryout, earned his spot on the team and signed a contract on Tuesday morning. Later in the week, the Penguins fell to the Florida Panthers 4-5 in overtime and beat the Chicago Blackhawks 2-5. Now, I don't know what you're thinking, Maddie, but I think we can expect to see some more upsets this season by the Pittsburgh Penguins. I agree with you, Izzy. The Penguins have managed to pull off some big wins already without their stars, but I still think Tampa Bay still looks good for the position for their third streak, Stanley Cup. Another high-intensity game was that electric, was electric to watch was the brand-new Seattle Kraken versus the Vegas Golden Knights. The Kraken is a brand-new franchise that was founded in 2018, and they finally played their first game in history last Tuesday. The opening ceremony featured both of the team's mascots facing off. A real golden knight was battling a light show Kraken, and it sure had that Las Vegas flair. Vegas got on the scoreboard pretty early in the first, e first period, and that game was very back and forth until the last few minutes of the third period, where the Krakens found themselves tied to the Golden Knights 3-3. 30 seconds after the teams were tied, the puck deflected off Vegas' forward Chandler Stevenson's skate. It slid past Seattle's goaltender Philip Grubauer to put Vegas up 4-3. Seattle's fans were not very happy about that controversial call. For those who are unaware, the player must use a skate to direct the puck or deflect the puck into the net, but he cannot allow, not, it's not allowed to kick the puck into the net to score. Although the Kraken had a tough loss for their first game, they ended the week with a tie and a win, leaving them with a 1-1 one one record. The Golden Knights were defeated later on in the week, leaving their stains to be 1-1. One one. Yeah, and on a positive note, the Buffalo Sabres kicked off their season with two wins against the Arizona Coyotes and the Montreal Canadiens. And this is a huge turnaround for them as they lost 18 consecutive games last season. So let's hope they can keep this streak moving forward. Yeah, and on a not so positive note, let's talk about Colorado Avalanche and their dramatic start. Their star player, Nathan McKinnon, tested positive for COVID-19 and has to follow protocol, causing him to miss a few games. Another Avs issue is their captain, Gabriel Landeskov, is on a two-game suspension for illegally boarding Blackhawks forward Kirby Doc in the first game of the season. And overall, I think this NHL season will be one for the books, and I'm looking forward to get back to regular season play, as last year the Canadian teams could not cross over to the U.S. border, so they had to improvise and create temporary divisions for the season. Yeah, Izzy, and not to mention the new pregame, intermission, and postgame segment TNT will be hosting. It will be in a similar feel to the NBA segment hosted by Shaquille O'Neal and his crew. This show will be hosted by sports commentator Liam McHugh, Hall of Famer Wayne Gretzky, studio analyst Anson Carter, retired head coach Rick Tockett, and host of Spain Chicklets Paul Bissonetti. And if you're looking for any exciting games this week, this Tuesday, tune into the Florida, Bay, the Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning as they will face off at the Amalia Arena at 6 p.m. And finally, the Boston Bruins and Buffalo Sabres will play on Friday at 6 p.m. And let's see if those Sabres can keep their winning streak alive. Yeah, and don't forget about the Colorado Avalanche, who's scheduled to play at the Washington Capitals on Tuesday. Will Alex Ovechkin defeat the high-scoring Avs? I don't know. Find out next Monday on Rock Chalk Replay. Now we will hear from Jordan and Kyle about the MLB playoff pictures. What you got for us, boys? Thanks, Izzy. We are doing great over here. But since the last time we talked, the divisional series shaped up to be quite entertaining, and so we are going to see catch everybody up to speed. Kyle, tell us about the things and how they played out in Boston. Yeah, Jordan. The Boston Red Sox um, are coming off of an impressive win over their longtime rival New York Yankees in the wild card round, and they had a daunting task in front of them in the divisional. The Tampa Bay Rays were, one of, were the one seed on the AL side of the bracket and got a win to start the series 1-0. Something clicked, however, for the Red Sox over the next three games. They won three in a row, and they hit walk-offs in two of the three to upset the Rays and move on to the ALCS. Unlike the Rays, who had the better record but lost, Tell us about the Astros, who seemingly held on to beat the White Sox. Yeah, so looking at the Houston Astros series, they were ab able to knock off the division champ Chicago White Sox in four games. Looking at the scores, you can see that none of these games were too close, and the Astros' offense was able to roll over the White Sox pitching, which was considered to be a strong suit. The Astros will be looking to make it to back-to-back -back World Series for the third time in five years. They can get past the Red Sox. All right, Kyle. 
<clears throat> get us started with the National League. Yeah, and the Atlanta Braves, um, mi despite missing their star player Ron Ronald Acuna due to injury, continued to defy the odds. The headline for this series was pitching, specifically the Brewers pitching, and after a 2-1 win to start the series, the Brewers looked to be living up to their expectations. However, Atlanta shut out the Brewers in Game 2 and then rolled on to win the two, more, uh, the two other games in the series on a walk-off in Game 4, sending the Braves to the NLCS. Despite injuries and a sub-90 win record, the Braves continue to win in the postseason and now have a rematch of last year's NLCS against the Dodgers. Jordan? You now have the honors of walking us through maybe one of the most memorable series and games in a while in the MLB postseason. Yeah, Kyle, heading out west to San Francisco, the series everyone was looking forward to was the division Logan battle Webb between the Dodgers and Giants. It did not disappoint. The series was the, the first time these two rivals had ever met in the playoffs, and how fitting it was that they were also the two best teams through 162 games. Despite some of the best postseason pitching we have ever seen by Logan Webb in Game 1 and Game 5, the Giants fell just short of moving on as the Dodgers took a winner game five to move on to the NLCS and, and uh, rematch with the, <clears throat> the Braves, uh, rematch of last year's NLCS with the Braves. Now, Kyle, finish us off. Yeah, so um, as we progress further and further into the postseason, let's take a look at the updated postseason bracket. The Red Sox are playing the Houston Astros in the ALCS. We're already two games into that series and the series is tied at one heading into Game 3 at Fenway, actually tonight. Um, in the NLCS, however, the Dodgers and the Braves are playing in a rematch of last year's series where the Dodgers won in seven games. This series is going to be played at the two teams' home stadium when it was only played in Texas last year, and the Braves have home field advantage this year. So far, the Braves have won back-to-back -back games on a walk-off RBI single to take a two-game to zero series lead, heading into Game 3 at Dodger Stadium tomorrow afternoon. We will see who makes it to the World Series this year as we progress further into the postseason each and every day. After the commercial break, Kristen will be back with everything you need to know about women's sports here in Lawrence. For students searching for a way to stay active in an outdoorsy way, the city of Lawrence has bike trails running in every direction and with the new Bike Share program, we can stay in shape as we tour the sites of our beautiful city. Clinton Lake is only a short 30 minute bike ride away from Daisy Hill and has the most incredible sunset location in all of Lawrence. Walking campus may give you the KU calves, but biking can give you the KU thighs. Bike Lawrence today. Welcome back. It's been two weeks since we last checked in on our women Jayhawk athletics, so let's get started. This tennis team had great success last weekend at the Red and Blue Challenge at SMU. The doubles team of Julia Deming and Maria Tatova went on to win the entire tournament, beating the host team of SMU 6-4 in the finals. Their next matches will be at the ITA Regional Championship this weekend. KU's women's cross country ran at the competitive pre-national invitational this past weekend in Florida, finishing in 26th place. This was their last race before competing in the Big 12 Championship in two weeks. Kansas Volleyball played Texas last weekend at home. The Jayhawks went into a five-set match in their first game before falling to the Longhorns. They then went 0-3 to the Longhorns for their second game. Kansas then traveled down to Waco, Texas to compete against the Baylor Bears. In both games, the Jayhawks fought hard but lost 3-1. Their next game will be against the Oklahoma Sooners next weekend. Last weekend, KU Soccer beat number 9 West Virginia 2-1. This was the first time in program history that the Jayhawks beat two ranked teams in a single week. Their next game was on Thursday against Oklahoma. The Jayhawks fell to the Sooners 3-2 with the late goal made by the Sooners in the second half. The soccer team is currently taking a small break before returning to play Friday in Lubbock against Texas Tech. Now, I toss it to Emma and Andrew who preview the NBA season which kickoffs tomorrow night. Guys? Kristen, that's right. The NBA season is officially kicks off tomorrow. How do you feel about that, Andrew? Yeah, you know, Emma, it feels like just yesterday that the Bucks were hosting the Larry O'Brien Trophy for the first time in 50 years, but I can't complain. I love basketball, NBA, college basketball just around the corner, so we're going to be spoiled with basketball for a while. Um, so, you know, tell us about uh, the Eastern Conference and who, who you think will um, compete this year. Yeah, so I see what you're saying. Last season ended in nothing short of spectacular finish, and it's a new season with newly loaded teams. 
So let's get right into it. Today we're going to stick with the top three teams in each, each conference. I'll start with the first. So starting in the East, I really like Atlanta Hawks coming in at number three. Trey Young made some great improvements and had great success in last year's postseason. They also re-signed re John Collins, creating plenty of depth in such a young roster. With a young team and a strong franchise, uh, it's building up and definitely will be in the top of the conference in the upcoming seasons. The Hawks are, the Hawks are a lot. Who do you think? Who's next? Yeah, and I really like the Bucks again. They returned nearly a complete carbon copy roster of last season despite losing P.J. Tucker to the Miami Heat. You know, I don't think that P.J. Tucker's loss will be detrimental to the team. You know, he was a kind of man who presented a lot of physicality, but I think that's an easy replaceable um, piece. You know, Bobby Portis is back, a lot of energy, a lot of physicality there. So I think the Bucks um, are for sure going to be another contender. Um, so we got one more spot. You've you got to be thinking the Nets, right? It's a no-brainer. Definitely a Brooklyn Nets. Um, they had great potential last season, but they did come up short um, to Milwaukee in the playoffs. But with returning, they have James Harden and Kevin Durant, um, and the rest of the depth chart will have an unbelievable season if they all stay healthy and injury-free. With or without Kyrie, the Nets are in favor of being the top team in the league with the newest additions like Patty Mills, Kessler Edwards, Daron Sharp, and Cam Thomas. The Nets are an 8 or 9 team deep and will come out strong as they are predicted to win it all. Now we go to the Eastern Conference, or now the Eastern Conference sorted out, now let's go to the Western Conference, which is loaded with seven teams that might pull 50 plus wins this season. season. Tell us about it, Andrew. Yeah, I feel like I got a lot of pressure to make the right pick, but it's too easy. The Phoenix Suns have to be in the conversation once again. Runners up in the summer, obviously falling to the Bucks, but they bring back a, ma a magical three musketeer trio in Chris Paul, Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton from Arizona. Plus, they have a great supporting cast on the bench, and they are just scary talented. There's, there's not a doubt that they won't be back in the NBA Finals. I agree with the experts. You know, this team um, is going to see a return, so surprise me. Who you got next in that Western Conference 2 spot? Obviously, I have to go with the Splash Bros. Steph Curry and Klay Thompson are back after two seasons of being away from the court. The duo might be able to regain their victorious state like they used to be in the previous years. The return of healthy Klay Thompson may lead to the Warriors to be finalist competitors, but who knows if he's still the best shooter in the league as he sustained multiple leg injuries. The ball's in your court next. Who you got? Yeah, a team that hasn't proven a lot, but I think they have a lot to prove, and that's the Utah, the Utah Jazz. Excuse me. A core group of guys are back as well as a new slate of newcomers in Rudy Gay, Eric Pascal, Hassan Whiteside, excuse me, and then from the draft, Baylor's Jared Butler. Um, so just an all-around team, guys, that can knock down the outside shot, get inside, attack the rim. So very talented. Hopefully that they can make a little deeper playoff run, maybe the conference finals. So, um, you know, it'll just be interesting to see if they can put all the pieces together. Um, the league has had a successful preseason, and teams continue to sack their rosters for the regular season to begin. So there's a lot of talent, and we'll just be interesting to see how all, the, all of those things play out. Yeah, it should be enjoyable to watch this year. After the break, Riley Kramer will review NFL Week 6. You may not hear it at first, but it's there. Our chant, rising. On this summit, callings converge. Voices unify into a chorus. That sounds out for good. For greatness. Can you hear it? Week six of the NFL started off with a great matchup between the Buccaneers and the Eagles, as Tom Brady and the Bucks were able to take away the win away from home. Sunday's matchups were highly anticipated, as a few teams were able to give us a glimpse into the conference rankings. The Baltimore Ravens and Los Angeles Chargers, both ranked at the top of the AFC North and AFC West, faced off at noon with the Ravens defense continually shutting down Justin Herbert after having a rather average season so far. The Ravens quarterback Lamar Jackson and his offense were able to run the ball against the Chargers defense, which they weren't equipped to keep up with. The Ravens led by four touchdowns going into the fourth quarter and ended the game with a score of 34 to six, taking home the win and securing the best record in the entire AFC. The Kansas City Chiefs were looking for a comeback this week and ended up being able to pull it off against the Washington football team. The Chiefs were looking slow in the first half as they trailed Washington 10 to 13 going into the third quarter. The Kansas City offense was struggling to keep the ball in their possession, but demonstrated a big second half revival, not only on offense as they were able to score three more touchdowns, but on defense as well, holding the score steady for Washington the entire second half. The Chiefs took home the win in Washington 31 to 13. The Sunday night football game was a concerning scene as the Seattle, Tree, 
Seahawks <laughs> traveled to Pittsburgh to face the Steelers on their own turf. The Seahawks trailed the Steelers closely the whole game up until the fourth quarter when Seattle kicked a field goal to tie the game 20 to 20 and send it to overtime, where the Seahawks would eventually fall short by one field goal. During this Sunday night football game, the Seahawks defensive end Darrell Taylor suffered what appeared to be a severe neck injury during the fourth quarter that required him to be extensively evaluated before he was able to be moved, stabilized, and get carted off the field. He was taken immediately to the hospital. Fans, coaches, and players on both sides held concerned looks as both teams gathered around to send him off the field. The injury took place heading into the two-minute warning as the teams were tied. Taylor was said to have been moving all of his extremities on the way to the emergency room, which gave relief to fans and players. Pete Carroll, Seattle head coach, stated after the game that the preliminary results from the CT scan showed up clear and insinuated there would be more updates to come regarding Taylor's condition. This injury and potential outcomes has caused many people to react and reintroduce the issue of safety in the sport that seems to be improving too slowly. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you, Riley, and that is all we have for today's show. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you again next week, and we'll fill you in on all the professional sports as this is arguably the best time in sports. We get action from all the big four. So next week we will talk about both KU football and basketball as the Jayhawks welcome Oklahoma to town and men's basketball makes an appearance at Big 12 Media Day tomorrow. For the rest of our crew, I'm Andrew Lind. We will see you next week on Rock Chalk Replay. Rock Chalk, Jayhawks. Thank you.